What I want to do is talk a bit about um, the kind of admissions process from a, an admissions point of view for the parents. Um, I'm helped by the fact my daughter has been through the process in the last two or three years, uh, and that's uh, given me a different perspective on doing admissions than uh, would have been the case had I done this talk five or ten years ago. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, competitive applications, how to make a good application, what sort of things people like me are looking for, and I want to talk specifically about how parents can support their children making the transition to the university, because I think we tend to focus a lot on the, the process of getting in, we then tend to forget that once they're there, they've got to survive, and there's a lot that can be done between now and when they go to university to help prepare them for that. So we'll finish by talking about that. Right, to start off with, um, a few things about generally about university admissions. Um, this is a good time to be an applicant. Um, nationally, uh, in the UK, uh, there are a diminishing pool of 18 year old school leavers. That will continue for about 2021. Uh, there is obviously going to be uh, a result and outcome on admissions from the UK's decision uh, to leave the European Union. So at the minute, uh, Bath, about 78% of my applications come from outside of the UK but within the EU. And we don't anticipate we'll get some uh, EU students still, but we're going to see a significant decline, I think, in the number of EU nationals uh, opting to come and study in the UK. And the vast majority of UK universities have got very ambitious expansion plans uh, for their first degree student numbers. Uh, so you see places like UCL developing their new campus uh, in, on the old Olympic site. Uh, any of you who've kind of driven in on the A40 into London will see the new Imperial College uh, campus uh, developing uh, up towards Wembley Way. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, even universities that historically have been quite uh, difficult to get into are significantly expanding their provision and with a diminishing number of, of uh, applicants it's going to mean that there's more opportunity, uh, universities are going to become more flexible in my view uh, in the way that they regard applicants. Now that doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be a free ride and you don't have to do any work, there's still going to be courses that are competitive. I was doing an analysis for my uh, senior management team at uh, Bath about the likely implications of Brexit on, on our applications and it'll mean in something like uh, international management, instead of getting 35 applications for every vacancy, we'll probably be getting 25 applications for every vacancy. Well, that still means that we're being pretty competitive and selective over who we give offers to for that course. So, you know, there's going to be changes, but it's not automatically going to mean that the gates are open and you can just flood on in. Uh, you are still going to have to make good, strong applications. You're going to have to make you know, a good effort on your personal statement, you're still going to need to be aiming to get the best possible grades you can. That's combined with quite a lot of change, uh, particularly in English schools and colleges, with all the changes to qualifications. Uh, for the A level students, you're obviously now, uh, in many cases, second year going through uh, the changes uh, that have, have come in. So your teachers are still grappling with the new syllabus content, people are still trying to understand what the implications are of a qualification where it effectively goes back to where we were in the 1990s, where students are examined right at the end of the course rather than building the course up. Most universities have recognised that there's a consequence of change. So things like relying heavily on AS results as an indicator of students' final performance is something that we've kind of moved away from. Up until 2015, a lot of universities were beginning in the most selective courses to put a lot of emphasis on AS results. Pretty much every university has walked back from that position because of the, the significant changes that are going on. So we are desperately keen to get good students to apply to us. Uh, you as a good applicant have a lot to offer us uh, as, as, a, as a potential student. And of course we're also facing competition from other alternative routes. So some of you may be aware that uh, there's been a big expansion in degree apprenticeship provision in the last year or so. The government are now levying 3% of any company's annual turnover if it's company employing, I can't remember what the number is, but basically most medium and large companies are paying a significant amount of money over to this apprenticeship levy, and one of the few ways that they can access that is if they themselves start running their own training programmes, and a lot of universities are finding increased competition from employers who are effectively looking to run their own uh, training company. So just to give you a couple of examples, Dyson, uh, the engineering company just linked up with Warwick University and they've set up a brand new site, a new campus uh, near their research base in, in Wiltshire uh, and are looking to recruit 
think 30, 40 students a year into their engineering apprenticeship programme. You get a, a degree from Warwick University in mechanical engineering uh, if you get accepted on that scheme and you complete it. Most of the big accountancy companies are now offering degree apprenticeships. And what you effectively find is you're going to get paid to do study. So rather than you paying the university, the company will pay you to be a, a degree apprenticeship student. You'll do three or four days uh, a week working, and then you'll do some study, usually linked to uh, the university that's got particular strengths uh, in running the course linked to the employer. Um, it takes a bit longer, it's usually a four year degree or a five year degree instead of a uh, three year degree, but given that you're being paid to do it, uh, that may not be such a hardship. The challenge is it's not going to give you the same experience as being a student. You're not going to have clubs and societies, you're not going to necessarily have the same support networks around you um, because you could be based anywhere where the company might have a, an operation. But for some students, that would be a perfectly good uh, route for them. and. Like I said, there are some, some advantages on the funding side. So there's lots going on, and I think you as applicants need to be aware of that. You can apply for both. You can apply for a degree apprenticeship, and you can apply to university. They are mutually exclusive processes, so we wouldn't know that you apply for a degree apprenticeship if you applied to do an accounting degree with us at Bath. Equally, if you're thinking about studying abroad, and a lot of more students are beginning to think about that as an option, particularly those of you who've got IBs, it's a very transferable and portable qualification, then you might also be thinking about doing that as another alternative and just seeing where the opportunities are there. So I'm being quite um, even-handed here. I just want you to be aware that there are choices, and one of the things that you need to be doing is investigating those choices and working out what's the best one for you, irrespective of what people like me in universities are telling you that we should be doing. Um, I think it's important, it's your life, it's your future, it's your money, uh, and therefore it's important that you do the things and best suit your, your potential outcomes for your future development. So, that's where universities currently stand. When it comes to applications, um, I think what we are keen to emphasise is that course matters more than place. So it's very important that you pick the right course to study. Where that course is, is a second order issue because you need to do well on the course. Most employers care how well you've done, they don't necessarily worry too much about what the degree is in. 60% of, of graduate jobs don't specify a particular degree, but they will expect you to have got a good result. You're much more likely to get a good result if you're studying a course that inspires you and excites you, that on a cold, wet winter's morning when you've got a force nine gale blowing and you've got a two mile walk from, from where you're living to the university lecture hall, you can be bothered to get out of bed because you were excited at the prospect of a lecture. If you can find the course that fits that criteria, you'll generally do well at university. And the problem tends to be the student who is maybe influenced more by the perceived reputation of the university and then tries to shoehorn what they actually want to do into what the university offers. The best example I can give you of that is my time when I worked at Oxford. Um, where we were getting 13 applications per place for economics and management, but at least two or three of those applicants per place were people who really wanted to do a business management degree. Oxford doesn't offer business management as a first degree, but students would apply because economics and management have management in the title. It was a very maths oriented economics course, and then it was economics, and it was the hard type with the statistics and the econometrics, and even the management stuff tends to be more theoretical, macroeconomics, not the kind of hands-on practical sort of stuff that students want to do. So those students were effectively wasting their application. It was very clear from their personal statement in their UCAS application that they wanted a business course, and we just knocked those straight out of the uh, park as far as uh, the application process was concerned. So you only get five choices to apply for. You've got loads of opportunities. There's something like 37,000 different degree courses <coughs> currently available in the UK. So my suggestion as a starting point is to figure out what you want to do. And the best way to do that is to go on the UCAS website, the University and College Admission Service website, and just see what's out there. There are a lot of degrees and subjects that you've never even heard of yet. Possibly at universities you don't even know exist. And that doesn't mean that's a bad choice. So to give you a couple of examples, um, there's a degree course in disaster management at Oxford Brookes University, I think Manchester Metropolitan University do it, and I think Wolverhampton do it, and Coventry. They're the only ones to my knowledge who do, but if you are interested in either getting into working in aid agencies, or maybe thinking of a career in the British Army, uh, or you're thinking of uh, working for United Nations Relief Agency, 
that course is probably much better preparation than anything else you could possibly do because you get taught by people who've actually gone out into disaster zones and brought some order back to chaos. You get placement opportunities to go and work for the organisations, managing in those areas. You will pick up language skills, cultural awareness skills, practical skills that will help you. So think a little bit more about what you're capable of doing rather than being too narrowly tied to the subjects you're doing at your higher level in your IB or on your B-Tech or in your a level course. Because at this point, you've got the world to play for and you've got a couple of months to actually do the research and find out a little bit more about what you might be qualified to do. In my case, just to give you an example, I thought at the age of, of 17 I wanted to be uh, a journalist, so I applied to do English literature and history. Uh, English literature, because I thought that's what you needed to do to be a journalist in history, because I actually liked it. Um, and I, I ended up applying uh, for a job in the Hong Kong police after I left university, and then 20 odd years on director of admission to the UK university. So, you know, people's job priorities change. Um, the latest research suggests that most graduates will have six different career changes <coughs> in the course of their working life. There isn't such a thing now as a job for life. Um, and a lot of what you will gain from university will be the, the broader skills base, the adaptability, the uh, intellectual um, capability to look at new challenges. I was at a school this morning down in Surrey. There was a, a, a presentation they had up on the wall as I was waiting to go and uh, do the talk. 65% uh, of jobs that seven-year-olds seven do haven't will be doing haven't yet been invented. So if you think about the developments that technology have brought to society, the types of jobs that now exist that didn't exist in the 1990s, particularly linked to you know internet and, and uh, technological developments, then there's everything uh, to say about that university should give you a broader training than a very narrow. You know, here yes, do three years history, and, and that's all you do. You can look at some dates, and they will talk with confidence about who you know Ferdinand of uh, Austria was. It's actually more about the skill set than the development of the student being <coughs> useful to in the longer term. So um, you've got to start doing your research now. A few things that you need to watch out for. Uh, you've all had the chance today to wander around picking up prospectuses. Bear in mind, prospectuses are marketing <coughs> documents. People like me spend an age trying to figure out the psychology of your average 17 or 18 year old and then produce a prospectus that's going to be appealing to the audience. So there are some things you will notice as you start flipping through the prospectuses. All universities are obviously inhabiting a world that currently exists in Bromsgrove. Uh, so all universities inhabit a world where the sun always shines, notwithstanding the fact that you're going to be there from late September through to mid-June in any given year. <coughs> Only attractive people are allowed to go to university if you look in the prospectus, and some students get worried about the prospects of getting in. Good news, if you are challenged in that area, if you look a bit frightening or intimidating, you just airbrush you out of any photographs you have to appear in Western <laughs> just say don't put off next year, that be cool. Some universities have no attractive students, so they hire models for their prospectus shoots. Uh, so you know, just be careful, you know, don't kind of Think, oh well, the person on page 57 of the prospectus is giving me a special wink. Uh, they probably do go to the university. Um, so don't build your life around the pictures. Look at the content. Things I would strongly advise you kind of pay attention to when you think about courses. Are you actually qualified to get in? Um, every year I reject a handful of applications for psychology because they obviously haven't bothered to read the, the prospectus and you like they need a B in maths at GCSE and a B in English language at GCSE. Psychology with us is a course where you have to do some statistics and do a lot on child language development learning. And if you can't get minimum GCSEs of that sort of group, you know you will struggle with the course content. So we're not setting you up to feel by admitting you if we know that there are markers at GCSE that will help. Our uh, architecture course, typically, I'm getting 12 applications per place. That would be pretty choosy. Our average accepted applicant has five year stars at GCSE. So if you're looking for a benchmark for something like uh, architecture, that's what we'd be expecting to see. Uh, now we do, you know, it's not the be-all and end-all if you haven't, if you've strong, got strong, stronger elements in your other elements of your application, but you know, you need to build a picture in the university perspectives and the website will give you that information. Think about things like assessment methods. Some of you will know now, well, in fact I'll ask a question, is there anybody here who would really love to go to university for three or four years and their entire degree depends on a small series of final examinations taken in the last two or three weeks of the course where anything that you study could potentially come up. 
Is there anybody who thinks that would be a marvelous way to get their qualification? Okay, so we're not going to have any applications for Oxford or Cambridge <laughs> this year from the school. So that's effectively how Oxford and Cambridge still assess. Now, the good thing is Oxford and Cambridge are very good at spotting students who've got the potential to do well in that type of assessment, and they will spend three years getting you to the point where you can do that through their tutorials, through the assessments that they give uh, in, in each term. Um, but it's, for some students, not going to be the right way to study, and there will better, be better options available to them. Other courses, there's a lot of emphasis, for instance, on um, uh, project work, group work. Uh, universities will have courses where half your degree will depend on your second year and half on your final year. So just think about what's going to work for you. Going back to my original point, employers care how well you've done. There is no point going to university, even if you love the course, and finding that you are let down because of a bad set of exam nerves or an inability to kind of engage with a particular exam technique. You know now, broadly speaking, how you learn best. So try and find courses that match your assessment style. Think a bit about um, added extra. So one of the reasons I moved from Oxford to Bath is I like the fact that Bath allows any student who comes to do a work placement as part of their degree. And you get a whole year on placement uh, with any of the courses we do at Bath. Or you go and study abroad for a year. I like the idea that students have the opportunity to kind of broaden their horizons as part of their degree. And that wasn't something that Oxford does as standard. Oxford allows you to spend part of your vacation periods doing placements with um, internships with their uh, alumna now, their, their, their graduates, but not as a kind of structured part of the course. So think about what added extras there might be. Think about particular areas of expertise that you might have developed. Think about um, whether there are opportunities to kind of study alongside people who are world experts in their field. There's a lot of options within the choice of the university and course to start thinking through. There isn't an easy answer to this, by the way. If, if there was a kind of um, ten-point question list I would give you to help you, I would. But of course, what's important to one student will not be important to another student. So each individual student, I think, needs to kind of come up with their own wishes. What would their perfect course be like? For some people, it might be things like, you know, how far away from your parents is a good distance? Now, you might have a different answer to your parents about that. But, you know, it matters. You know, most students go within about two hours of home. Two hours is far enough to be independent for your parents not to come and visit you unexpectedly, catch you doing things that they'd rather not see. Uh, but equally, it's close enough to get over an emergency or if you're running short of cash or a friend's got a good party on and you want to just whip back to that. Um, it's also not so far away your parents just tell you to find your own way home. So, you know, if you go from here to Aberdeen, well, you could fly from Birmingham, but if you expect your parents to tootle backwards and forwards at the end of each turn to pick your stuff up, don't count on it. Once you're there, you're probably there for your three or four years to get more. So just think about that sort of stuff. Um, think about size of place. Some people want to be in big cities, some people want to be in quite rural environments. The amount of hobbies you've got and interests you've got, well, again, I think it's important to think about that when you're looking at university. Um, you may be a great swimmer. Well, find a university that's got a pool, probably uh, an Olympic sized pool. Think about it being on campus so it's easily accessible. Hopefully, it's, it's quite heavily subsidised, so you don't pay it every time you have to use it in an extortion amount. That's got to be a much better experience for somebody who's really interested in swimming than somebody who has to kind of track across to the city to use a municipal pool where you've got to pay commercial rates to use it every time you want to go train. So things like that matter, partly because if you've got a hobby or an interest or a sport you do and the university can support it, you know when you go there, there will be people who share that interest who will be part of your new friendship group. Because that's one of the issues about transition. You're not going to move to university with your friends that you've currently got. Even if they're at the same university, the average size of university now has 18,000 students. If they're not on the same course or in the same accommodation, you're probably never going to see them. And you're going to start making new friends fairly quickly. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So pick the course, then start worrying about where the universities are. That will help. There's over 350 colleges and universities and institutes of higher education. Because you're only allowed to apply for a maximum of five, it's quite important that you find ways to narrow it down. So if you kind of focus on the course, not every university does every course. If you think about what you want to study within the degree, that will take choices away, which is a good thing. And you probably want a working list of between eight and 12 universities that you are seriously looking at, that you go and visit, that you find out more about to be able to make that final set of five choices. Okay? Right, when it comes to the application, the application is more complex, it looks more complex than it is. 
So it's an online form now for any of the parents who uh, are my age or a bit younger, you know, the database form. It's not that anymore, it's an online application. Schools probably have already started kind of training on how to use that. It's a kind of password protected system, but you can go on, you can do bits of, of the application, and then you can save it. So you don't have to kind of start all over again. I always say to students, try and get as much of it done this academic year. Uh, certainly kind of get used to using the system whilst the school is still available. If they, can, if they need help, you can kind of lock down the system or anything like that. But you find out now, and then you do something about it, and you find out halfway through August, when you begin your application, you find out you get access to the system. Um, much of the information is not going to change between now and when you apply. So things like your name, where you live, your date of birth, highly unlikely that that's going to change. So you may as well get that into the system and lock it. Your GCSE results, if you did GCSEs, um, you know, unless you're taking any resets, that's the GCSE results you've got to apply with. So again, find your results slips which have been carefully hidden in the loft, uh, rather than trying to scrambling around the day before they're all due in and you can't figure out what your GCSEs are because it was so long ago you've forgotten. So that sort of thing you can do now. That then leaves some key things, picking your courses, choosing which five universities. You don't have to uh, worry about ranking the universities in any sort of order. Again, that's a big change from where we were 20 odd years ago. Uh, you just put them down in alphabetical order. So Bath is usually near the top of your list. York is always going to be somewhere near the bottom of anybody's list uh, because of, of where they appear in the alphabet. The personal statement, which is the thing that most universities put a lot of reliance on, is something that you're going to take a fair bit of time to do. Normally, students will have about five or six drafts of a personal statement. It's quite a challenge. It's a, a 40, uh, sorry, 4,000 character, about 400 word long personal essay, I guess is the best way to describe it, that the student does to explain to the admissions tutors at the university they're applying to about why they are right for the course that they're applying for. Uh, that translates into about 37 lines of text, um, and you can't write more than that. Basically, the system cuts you off. So if you write more than 37 lines, it goes chunk, and, and you don't ever find out what your killer closing sentence was in your application. Uh, it just remains a mystery to the entire world. So think about what you want to do. The problem challenge is when you first start writing, you're sitting with a blank computer screen, and a lot of students get to get intimidated, they can't think of anything to say. So don't worry about the word count. When you're doing your first draft, just get down anything you think is relevant. It's much easier to edit down a 900 word personal statement to 400 words than it is to try and hit 400 words on the first draft. And if, you, if you're worried even about trying to do that, break it down into paragraphs or even small sentences. So think about what an admissions tutor is going to be looking for. Firstly, I want to see some evidence of motivation. Why do you want to do the degree? Two or three sentences about what it is about the course you've applied for. And remember, it's one personal statement to cover all five of your choices. So it has to be specific enough to make me think that you're really talking about that, but generic enough for the other four universities to think you're talking about them as well. So, you know, if you want to do, say, a management degree, what is it about management? What specifically within management do you want to study and what's been the trigger for that? Why do you want to spend another three, four years of your life studying management? Then talk a bit about what you've done to develop your interests. I would say 80% focus on the personal statement about why you want to do the degree and what you've done to demonstrate it, and then 20% on your hobbies and your interests and your yeah, curriculum activity is about the right balance. So a second paragraph about your motivation. Now, uh, sorry, about your, what you've done to develop that interest. So that's more than I have studied some relevant qualifications in my, my sixth form. When I worked in admissions in Oxford, English literature is a good example of this. We used to get loads of applicants say, oh, I'm absolutely passionate about studying English literature at Oxford. Well, I wouldn't say at Oxford, but the implication is there. And then they tell us about the three books they've read in detail on their A-level course. Now, the problem is A-level English literature, sorry, the degree course in English literature at Oxford, in the first eight-week term, I would expect you to read 40 texts, that's four zero texts, and write eight three to 5,000 word essays. So if, in fact, your impression of hard work and real engagement with English is to read three books you've been required to read for two years, that doesn't say to me you've got the capability or the capacity to do well on an English literature degree. I'm looking for extra reading. I'm looking for a bit of self-analysis about why you like particular genres of writing and fiction. I'm looking for authors specifically that you've been inspired by and why. Things that you can be doing to help. Uh, I know the students who are doing uh, A-level have a chance to do the extended project qualification. 
Many universities really value it. It's an independent research project, typically about half, it's about an AS level's worth of work. 5,000 word uh, project. Can be about anything, but most students try and tie it into what they're going to do their degree on. Uh, you can go into a fair bit of detail in 5,000 words. I'm not sure that you can um, research uh, for an extended piece of writing, which universities value. Uh, you'll have to uh, use research resources for the first time, maybe outside the school. That's good, we like that. You've got to motivate yourself to do the work. You're probably doing it in your own time, a lot of it over the vacations or in, in, in half term. And again, we like the fact that it shows skills you're going to use when you get to university. At Bath, at Southampton, at Lancaster, for pretty much every degree that they offer, if you do well in the EPQ, get an E or an A star, it will automatically take a grade off the final result that we ask for. So if you apply to do architecture at Bath, which is A star, A, A, if you do well in your EPQ, it becomes a 3A offer. No questions. You know what you mind, what you did your EPQ about. For the IB students, we automatically take into account the core points you can get uh, on your extended essay. So at Bath, it's a 36 point offer, but you can include your core points if you get the, the bonuses uh, for both the talk, the theory of knowledge, and the extended essay towards your 36 points. So we're recognising that project skills add value to your yeah, ability as a student. Other universities like Manchester, York, Bristol, uh, Sheffield, Royal Holloway, Liverpool are all uh, beginning to, in, in at least some of their subjects, recognise the value of EPQ. Another thing you might want to do is something called the Luther Massive Online Learning Course. These are things that universities have been developing globally for the last three or four years. Uh, so they're basically online short courses. Uh, free usually to do, uh, you can pay a small charge, 10, 15 pounds and get a certificate at the end of them, but it's not necessary. Basically it gives you a chance to kind of do some university level study online. Courses typically last about three to six weeks, usually a couple of hours a week. Uh, so it is something you can fit around your existing studies. Very, very good way to kind of get into a topic in a level of detail you wouldn't cover on your A level or your IB high of course. So to give you again some examples from Bath, we do, or we have done a course online on um, cancer, causes of cancer and treatment of cancer. So anybody who's thinking about things like oncology, medicine, biomedical sciences, biochemistry, would be a very good course of counselling even, would be a good course to get into. Uh, we've got a course currently running on drones and drone technology and warfare. So if you think about the history or conflict, studying the politics and international relations, that might be a good thing. We've just launched a book on Monday uh, for EPQ students to support students doing an EPQ, trying to develop skills, give resources that are going to enhance the chance of getting a high grade. The, the big players in this uh, in the UK are FutureLearn, which is a branch of the Open University. So if you just type FutureLearn into uh, a search engine or, or MOOC, M O O C, then that's a good place to start and you'll see all sorts of options available to you. But things like work placements, work experience, uh, just why you're reading around the topic and, and talking about it in your personal statement, all of that matters. And then the final thing that I like to see um, is some evidence, and this is the kind of final paragraph probably, about what you've been doing outside of your studies, which will make you a better student at university. A big concern for people like me is, particularly for competitive courses, we make offers to people who don't stay more than a couple of weeks, they get intimidated, it's not the right course for them, they're finding the whole struggle of living away from their family and their friends challenging even though we've got lots of support available to them to help them settle. And therefore, I'm looking for some evidence in your personal statement that you are the sort of person who perseveres, you're not a quitter, you are somebody who is resilient, who is prepared to face new challenges, expose yourself to different cultures, different experiences, see positives in things. Um, and there are things you can be doing at the moment, clubs, societies, activities, Duke of Edinburgh Award, anything like that. Uh, again, for the um, IB students, this is where your cars um, can be really helpful because a lot of the activities you're doing in cars to improve you in these experiences. And I'm expecting you to be a bit self-aware. Think about what you've done, how you've overcome challenges, write a little bit about that in personal statement. Once you've done that, you get the thing off as soon as possible. Um, I think a lot of students did that. Uh, my daughter, she could have got a degree in prevarication. Uh, she had got her first honours degree. Uh, she was, you know, fiddling around. It was getting close to the deadline. She was, you know, rewriting all the sentences here and there. To be perfectly honest with you, what she had completed by October was just as good as what she eventually submitted when she uh, applied. Um, and effectively, she was just getting more caught up in rewriting the thing than just getting on and focusing on what she needed to, which was getting the results she needed to get into university. 
Um, so I'd aim to try and get your first draft of your personal statement done early, well, if you can, before you finish this year. Uh, certainly work on it over the vacation period. For those of you applying for Oxford Cambridge Medical School, Dental School, of Veterinary Science courses, we have an application by the 15th of October anyway. For anybody else, you technically have until the 15th of January, but to be honest, if you get in by early November, you'll be in the first 30% of people who are applying nationally, if yours are typical. And it means that people like me, when we're sitting in our offices looking at applications, I've got all the time in the world in October to look at applications, so I'll start making offers as soon as good people start applying. If you wait until the last possible minute, last year about 100,000 of the 500,000 people who applied waited until the last 24 hours before the deadline, um, and therefore just gets caught up in the, in the process. I've got 20 staff doing the admissions at Bath. Um, I can't make them work any harder than they do. So if they're having to deal with a fifth of the applications in that final couple of months before the deadline, uh, our deadline for making decisions comes in, it, it's all a bit more rushed and a bit more pressurised, and we don't necessarily have the same level of resource to deploy to, to look at things where you know we've got some ambiguity. We will do our best, but we are we you know if you come in in September, October with your application, we've got loads of time to follow up and ask follow up questions. If you apply in January. To be honest, we'll, we'll do what we can. All of our applications will be read by these two members of my team. But by that stage, I've got a good sense of how many places I've got left. I've got a good sense of how many applications we've got in total. I can start being a little bit more ruthless and maybe I'll receive back in September. Sure. Try and get your applications in. Right, a few final points and to finish. That's all very well and good. Students who are at this school will get a load of help and support. So basically, um, you'll be fine. Academically, you are doing great courses that will set you up to do well in higher education. If you do your research, you'll, you'll find good courses to go for, you'll get reasonable offers, you'll, you'll do well. All of the problems that I've tended to notice in the 27 years I've been doing this type of work come from students then not being able to cope when they get to university. So we're going to play a quick quiz, because I love a quiz. Uh, the quiz rules are very uh, simple. If you can say yes to this question, you put your hand in the air. So, first question, this one just to the students in the audience. How many students could go to university tomorrow and survive on their own cooking skills for the next 10 weeks without getting scurvy or blinkets or any of their vitamin phase deficiencies? Hands in the air, folks. Hands down. Right. If you can't cook, you will automatically limit the range of universities you can apply to because roughly about half of all universities in the UK have as their accommodation either all self catered or the majority of their accommodation self catered. So you'll do all your research, you'll find a perfect course in a perfect university, then you'll realise that self catering, if you can't cook, you won't dare apply there. That is a stupid reason not to apply to university, if in every other respect it won't for you. You don't have to be a brilliant cook, five or six healthy, nutritious meals that you can build on. That's all we're asking. It will save you time, it will save you money, because if you're in a catered accommodation, the university generally gets you to pay for the food up front, and then doesn't give you a rebate if, in fact, you don't turn up for breakfast every morning at 7 o'clock, which many of you will not. Uh, if you do clubs and society sporting activity, you'll find that real times often conflict with training sessions or club activities. So again, you will be paying for food that you're having to sometimes just bolt down or not have because you're out on a train. <coughs> so at least if you're in self catered accommodation, you get a lot more flexibility. It's also a great way to make friends because there's always people at university, even universities that have self catered accommodation, who can't cook and they will die unless they can make friends with you. Don't worry about making friends, go to university, but it's only got self catered accommodation, hang around the kitchen and see them kind of you know, crawls towards you, the of salvation. Second question, this one to the parents in the audience. How many parents have ever let their child do the weekly or monthly shop on behalf of the family? <laughs> Two. <laughs> Three. Supplementary question, Paul. Um, your child's off to university in 18 months. How have you got any confidence they'll be able to look after themselves, budget well, manage to shop for themselves if you never let them try? So here's what you do. Next holidays, send your child, don't take them off to the nearest supermarket, 
give them £15 and tell them they've got to survive off that £15 for five days. And then just see what happens. There are only three possible outcomes to this experiment. <laughs> Option one, your child surprises you and they survive successfully for five days off £15. It won't be the most exciting culinary week they've ever had. You'll probably find that they are buying quite a lot of stuff they wouldn't normally touch. It's possibly not the healthiest of uh, meals they've ever had, but they'll be fine. And if they can survive off that, they're probably going to be fine at university. Option two, some students will remember this talk. They will hit social media, they will find that their friends' parents that week are also doing the same experiment. They will meet up, they will pool their money, because £30 between two goes a lot further than 50 between one, because you can buy multi-packs and split them. They'll be fine. That'll be the minority. The vast majority of students will spend the money eat the food, and then it'll be Tuesday. <laughs> but at least if everybody is aware of that now, you've got time to do something about it, and students can get used to the idea. Um, if you're near a shop, by the way, it's either Weird Girls or Marks and Spencer's, it be £25 to <laughs> give a child a fighting chance. Right. Third question, this one back to the students. How many students on a regular basis do their own laundry? Don't worry. Hands down. That's uh, better than I thought. Yes, you know. Right. Um, laundry and universities. You might be able to find accommodation in your first year where you can be fed. There are no universities, to my knowledge, that will do your dirty laundry for you. So you have two options: either. Spend the next year accumulating 10 weeks worth of clean clothing so that you don't have to do any laundry. However, you will find that there is nowhere to conveniently hide a growing pile of festering dirty clothes. And by third or fourth week of the university, the university will have sent in the health inspectors and condemned your room. So, you've got to learn to wash clothes. Now, I speak with particular passion about this because of the experiences of a friend of mine that definitely wasn't me. My friend decided to go to the university about two hours away from home. And their plan was that every other weekend they would return home with all their dirty laundry and their family would be so delighted to see them would spend the entire weekend washing and ironing all the dirty laundry. In theory it was an excellent plan and my friend had, a, had a, an additional twist which was they were going to take other people's laundry and they would charge those people for their parents to wash the clothes. So my friend turned up after two weeks at university with two kit bags full of dirty laundry, only to find his family rather inconsiderately gone on holiday. He so had to go back to the university with no clean clothes. He knew enough about washing clothes and he had to find a laundrette, so he went to the university laundrette and he went on a Sunday morning. Sunday morning was an excellent time to hit the laundrettes at university because nobody is awake. So you've got the complete run of all the working machines and the one working dryer. My friend knew enough about washing clothes to know he had to separate out the boil wash from the non boil wash, which he did, he put them into two separate machines. You also knew enough about washing clothes to know you have to add washing powder to the process, otherwise you just end up with wet smelling clothes. There was a machine on the wall that claimed that for 50 pence it would dispense a thimble full of, of detergent. And he thought, well, I've got a lot to do, so if I put a fiver's worth of change in there, that'll get me quite a lot of washing powder. And it did. Basically, you put the fiver's worth of change in, hit the button, torrent of washing powder poured out the machine, immediately filled up the thimble, losing it, prizing chaps, so he took his trainers off, filled his trainers with washing powder, and he entered them into two separate machines. Now, a side note here, if you do that, your trainers get impregnated with washing powder, and the next time it rains, you leave a very conspicuous trail of bubbles <laughs> all over the campus. Now, uh, the final thing, of course, you need to wash clothes successfully is water. My friend knew that and come prepared, he brought a bucket, and he walked backwards and forwards between the nearest taps and the laundrette filling up a washing machine with water. Watch by growing audience. We said nothing, and we could see what would happen when the money went in the slot to stop the machines going. The money went in the slot, the water came in the pipes at the back of the machines like it's supposed to, and the machines exploded. We put the laundry out of action for a week, and for the entire time that my friend was at university, he was just known as the kid that flooded out the laundry. Now, if you want to avoid social humiliation on a vast scale that stays with you for many years, uh, I suggest what you do is practice before you go. Now, don't practice on your domestic washing machine at home, because that bears no resemblance to any washing machine at university. You need to find a public laundry. There will be one somewhere within about a 20 mile range of Bromsgrove. Uh, you need to go with a whole load of clothes that you don't care about. If you've got a younger brother or sister, <laughs> take their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and just 
experiment, see how it goes. Um, again, uh, this isn't one where parents can participate, you don't need to take them. They can have the joy of walking back with you know half a ton of undried, unwopper, uh, wet laundry uh, as, the, as the room falls down. Um, it just needs to be something they do. Now, I've laboured this quite a bit, but this is the sort of stuff that throws students. They can cope with the academic stuff. They'll generally be fine if they've kind of done their research. They'll find people who want to be their friends. The thing that really throws them is all the domestic stuff that you probably generally do for them, and they just don't realise the part and parcel of being an adult. So if they go with that ability to do that, they just exude confidence. Other people will kind of gravitate towards them because they seem to know what they're doing, and it will just help them settle that much more easily. Now, um, just to finish off, why do we bother doing this sort of stuff? Um, the answer is, I think higher education is the best possible thing you can do. It's one of the few chances in life you've got to really do something you're going to engage with, uh, something that's going to excite you, range of opportunities will open up uh, for you as a result of that. Uh, in my case, I've got a year in America as part of my degree. I can honestly say that was a transformative experience. I never looked back. Before that, I was kind of a shy kid, um, you know, capable of getting on, but a quite small network of friends. Sticking in America for a year, my parents didn't let me come home. They basically said, we'll pay for a Greyhound bus ticket and go travel around the States for your Christmas vacation. That made me grow up very quickly, very fast, and you know, let me do a whole range of things which I would never have had the chance to do had I just stayed at Sheffield for uh, my three years of my degree. Um, it also just opens up opportunities subsequent to university. So I'll use my sister as an example of this. My sister realised quite early on, about the age of 14, she wanted to work in the fashion industry. As you can tell, this isn't a genetic trait, I'm <laughs> uh, We grew up in the North East, it wasn't a place where fashion was a kind of big thing. So she opted to go to London to do a high national diploma in fashion marketing and fashion journalism. She did her two years, graduated, couldn't get a job initially. Uh, she graduated in the early 90s, there was a bit of a recession on at the time. But she recognised to stay in London was probably the sensible thing to do because if there was going to be a recovery in the fashion industry, that was being where it would happen. She had a good network of friends she built up at university, many of them doing different fashion related courses, some friends who were stylists and jewellery designers and things like that. So she just continued to tap into her networks. You know, a friend had a, a market on Camden, uh, Camden Market, uh, making jewellery, uh, so she did the marketing for the, for the store. Another friend worked in a firm in Notting Hill, and they kind of said, well, you need somebody to basically be the, the receptionist of the PA. Uh, you've got typing skills, why don't you come and work, uh, apply for the job, the, the kind of maternity cover, which she did. And she just continued to kind of try new stuff and network and make contacts. One of the people she met when she was doing the uh, tending job uh, in, um, in Notting Hill uh, turned out to be U2's chief stylist. U2 were about to go on tour. They were impressed with my sister based on a kind of cup of coffee and a, a conversation. They kind of encouraged her to work with them for a month, just getting the kit ready for the band. So, you know, bonos, sunglasses, and edges, bobble hats, and that sort of thing. She really worked hard. They then created a job for her. She was a kind of wardrobe assistant, setting wardrobe assistant on the, the Pop Mart tour in 1995. Uh, that's what she's still doing. So her current job, she's head of ambience, job title, and um, wardrobe for Muse. So she's currently on tour with them in the States. She's probably going to work for Arcade Fire uh, in the, uh, later in the year when they go out on tour. She ran Beyonce's backstage crew at uh, Glastonbury a few years back. She worked for Me Too. She worked for Westbury. That was a fairly straightforward style and job, she said. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she, she, she got involved in the second live aid, uh, she, she did um, uh, Sting's makeup, you know, she, she's done all sorts of really wonderful stuff. None of it she attributes to her own ability, she, she puts it all down to the training she got on the course she did, the contact she made, the self confidence she developed, the willingness to take opportunities when they, when they present themselves. So I'm not going to suggest that's what you're going to end up doing, but I don't think she would have ever thought had she not gone to university that her life would have panned out as a task. So just see it's a range of opportunities that you can have uh, used to develop your, your chances in life. Right, I've probably wrapped it on longer than I said I would, and it's a hot evening. Are there any questions anyway about any aspect of the admission process? <coughs> yes, sir. Um, you talked about two to three people out of those 30 people applying for economics and management basically wrote their personal statement about business and management. Mm -hmm. But what if I want to apply for general engineering? However, for example, Imperial College doesn't offer general engineering. Do I write my personal statement only about 
Um, I think what you do is you identify what it is about engineering that excites you. Um, if you've got relevant work experience, you can talk about that. It doesn't matter for a general engineering degree what uh, you've covered, but it might matter for Imperial if you're going for one of their specific degrees. We don't get to see what you apply for, so part of the skill is to write a personal statement that is good for all five courses. If you think about the skills that an engineer needs to develop and demonstrate, it doesn't matter whether you're an electrical engineer, or mechanical engineer, or chemical engineer, actually there's some common skills built in mathematics, confidence in, in engaging with kind of practical elements of the course, some elements of um, project management, all of those sort of things that we've talked about. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> yes? Do you fill all the five places? You don't have to use all five choices, uh, and some students, if they're going for a very specialised course, there might not be five version options available in the UK. Um, so, you know, it's up to the student. I'd always suggest you have enough to give yourself a range. If you've only got a maximum of five, you can only ultimately end up going to one place anyway. And the way the process works is you put your application in, university's got a bit of time to decide how they then want to deal with that. By the end of March, we've got to usually have made a decision. Uh, so you'll know then which of the five choices you've got have got an offer for, and then when you've got all of your decisions back, whether they've accepted you or, or <coughs> turned you down, you then decide a firm choice, which is the place you really want to go to, and a backup choice, an insurance choice, and then other, any other offers you've got then kind of fall away, um, and then you wait to see your results. Generally speaking, your firm choice is the place which is um, you're most interested in, but it's not much point having an insurance choice where it's harder to get into, because actually if you don't first one, you default your insurance, and if, if it's a higher level of offer, you're not going to get in there either. Yes? Uh, on what basis do you decide if you want to interview the candidate? For most universities, it's uh, not something that happens now. There are certain courses where it's a requirement, so at Bath, uh, social work and pharmacy, we are required to interview students because of the nature of the course. Anything that involves teaching, many medical courses, nursing, they'll often have some form of interview assessment. Oxford and Cambridge interview, um, the only way you're going to get in is if you get as far as interview, but even there, uh, not everybody now gets interviewed. When I was director of admissions, we moved to a situation where we didn't interview more than three applicants for every vacancy. So in subjects like theology, we were pretty much interviewing everybody who applied because we got about three applications per place. Uh, for something like uh, psychology, uh, about half of the applicants were getting knocked out before we even got as far as interviewing. Uh, something like medicine, it was about a third of the applicants who got interviewed. And that's where things like admissions tests and um, assignments are being used to kind of pre-sift the applicant pool. Thank you. Any other questions? In that case, thank you for being such an attentive audience. I've got some respect to <laughs>